Great. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I'm uh, just really honored to be able to be facilitating this panel. Um, uh, this, this topic of sort of talking about productive uses of power and enabling microgrids in the path forward uh, for financing, things along those lines, that's the topic of this panel. And it's a topic that's sort of uh, near and dear to my heart and my research, so I'm very excited to hear what all of you have to say. Um, so I just wanted to start with a little uh, brief introduction um, of each of our panelists here. Um, so we've, we've just heard from, from Andy and a, a little bit of his background. Um, I, I guess I won't go into much more of your, of your background uh, uh, beyond sort of the work on at uh, uh, Power Africa. Um, moving on down the line, so Jake Cusack, uh, co-founder and managing partner of Cross Boundary, also co-leads the firm's advisory business uh, and adjunct investment platform, Cross Boundary Energy. Um, the work at Cross Boundary has included design and management of investment facilitation projects along those lines. So welcome. Um, Bunmi Adekore, um, who is from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, uh, has been an entrepreneur for more than a decade, working on hard, uh, hardware manufacturing enterprises and clean tech, semiconductor engineering and biotechnology. Um, and I thought uh, this was really nice from the, the bio that he is passionate on the role of disruptive technologies as an enabler of environmental stewardship, sustainable wealth, and value creation in emerging economies. Um, so, and last but not least, Alexia Kelly, CEO and managing partner from Microgrid Investment Accelerator, um, the first of its kind financing facility that seeks to mobilize private sector investment into clean energy and energy access microgrids in India, Indonesia, and East Africa. So welcome, all of you, thank you. Um, so what I thought, uh, we would start with sort of before we really get into the meat of the, the questions uh, that we have for the panel is um, giving each, we just heard from Andy sort of an update on Power Africa and where, where that is. I wanted to give an opportunity to the other three panelists to just sort of say a, very briefly sort of what's the status of what's going on with your organization? What's sort of new and innovative about what's going on uh, with your work right now? Um, and sort of giving a, you an opportunity to update this group, and then we'll jump into sort of uh, the more substantive questions for the panel. Sure, and uh, thanks, thanks uh, Duke, for, for having us. Um, so uh, I'm managing, co-managing partner at Cross Boundary. Uh, we have an inv <coughs> investment advisory business that's about uh, 30 investment professionals, primarily based in Africa, uh, three offices in Africa. We launched Cross Boundary Energy uh, starting in 2013 we were working with a lot of SMEs and, and businesses in Africa and seeing the high cost of energy that they faced, many of these businesses relying primarily on diesel power. And we thought there was an opportunity to bring the solar power purchase model to sub-Saharan Africa, that Solar City and Sun Edison had done successfully in, in more developed markets. So essentially, uh, we raised a fund and, and we finance uh, solar systems for primarily large multinational companies like Heineken, Unilever, Coca-Cola, um, we have a system at Garden City Mall, which is one of the largest malls in Nairobi, and we offer cheaper and cleaner energy uh, than those businesses were, were previously getting, and the average system size is about a megawatt. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the off-grid space on the advisory side, we've advised on several investments to solar home systems companies throughout uh, the continent. Uh, we have been dipping our toe and, and, and interested in mini-grids for a long time, and I think this will be the year that we actually begin to invest. We're hoping to invest between three to four million dollars uh, into mini-grid assets in East and, and Southern Africa uh, this year, which doesn't sound like a lot of money, but will still be about 70 sites, about 7,000 uh, connections, so it's still um, a meaningful first step. Uh, we can talk about this more, but you know, mini-grids are not standalone commercially sustainable. Uh, the rates of return are not there to do it purely on a private basis, so you need either concessional capital or subsidy or the involvement of the government to make them possible. Um, but they can obviously be hugely impactful in terms of delivering first world standard uh, power uh, to these villages that have been previously unelectrified. Bumiadakori, I'm with Breakthrough Energy Ventures, a uh, $1.2 billion fund uh, that was recently started by Bill Gates, 20-year um, fund. We are very different from your normal 
venture capital fund, uh, which is a 10-year horizon. This is a 20-year horizon. Um, we are specifically interested in greenhouse gas mitigation. So we really believe that if you take the world today at 50 gigatons per year, uh, increasing to about 80 gigatons per year by 2050, you really need breakthrough technologies to solve that problem. Um, thus, the name of the venture fund. Um, so we, we, we look at a variety of technologies across energy, transportation, alternative building materials, agriculture, um, water. Um, the water energy nexus is something that is very important to us. Um, and as part of that is the question of emerging world strategy. We really think that there is a real opportunity to create a difference in emerging countries, in Africa specifically. Um, I think some of the things that are of concern to us in Africa is actually going beyond access to the question of economic development, uh, which really comes to the sole question of what is the productive use of energy, and how do you actually invest in technologies that can facilitate income generation for people. Um, so this is beyond let's charge your cell phones and watch television to let's go do irrigation and uh, do commerce. Um, so we are probably going to try to figure out how to sponsor breakthrough technology in those areas. And we are still very much in blue sky mode. The fund was capitalized uh, last July, uh, even though it's a $1.2 billion fund. Uh, we are still relatively undeployed. I think we've only made three uh, non-public investments so far. We are trying to uh, develop a thesis for Africa. Uh, we believe that there's going to be a strong role for technologies like electrochemical storage. Uh, so moving beyond the question of diurnal storage to seasonal storage to long-term storage. Um, we, most of us are scientists and entrepreneurs by training, so uh, we really get into the technology questions of how do you create new technologies to solve that problem. Um, we think that there's going to be a role for new thermal generation assets. Um, so conventionally, diesel generation has been uh, the real backbone of uh, base load and obviously shifting to peak load now. Uh, can we develop new technologies that uh, deal with questions like methane utilization? Uh, you may know that in the developing world, uh, there's a lot of methane gas that is being flared. And how do we actually start thinking about you know, developing technologies for the onshore flared gas. You know, I think the offshore flared gas may be a lost cause, but um, in terms of making it uh, cost efficacious, we are really thinking about technologies for that. Uh, we think a lot about how you, you know, uh, empower people to um, uh, use energy in agriculture. Um, we are beginning to think about distributed fertilizers, uh, dry storage, electrification for storage applications. Uh, you take a country like Nigeria, for example, the amount of food that is lost in Nigeria is equivalent to 19% of the cultivated land surface. Um, so that is a very big problem, right? So, and that story replicates itself all over Africa. And so I, we, go ahead. Okay, I know I I'm sorry, make sure everyone uh, I got could to go <laughs> on and on about this, but uh, just, just to summarize, we, we are very interested in technology solutions uh, to empower economic development. Great, thank you. And Alexia? Hi, good morning everyone. Alexia Kelly, I'm the managing partner of the Microgrid Investment Accelerator. We are a blended capital fund that is looking to accelerate private sector capital into the microgrid energy access space in particular. Um, and the reason that we are raising a new fund to do this is for exactly the reasons that Jake was just talking about. Um, microgrids are really struggling to achieve commercial affordability in the absence of subsidies. Um, and it, microgrids are different from solar home systems in that they're an infrastructure play and they deliver infrastructure level returns. And so one of the challenges that we are grappling with as folks looking to accelerate investment into this space, it's very difficult to generate a risk adjusted return from a microgrid, um, particularly a microgrid that is serving people who have either never had access to electricity before or don't have access to the financial resources in order to purchase the productive end uses that are gonna power demand on their grids. And so the strategy that we've developed, we um, have early support from Facebook, actually, from their Energy Access Program, who seed funded our work uh, beginning in 2016. We've been undertaking a comprehensive market analysis and working with developers to really understand where their capital gaps are. And we started out thinking that we were going to be a project finance vehicle. 
And as we started digging into it, we realized that the microgrids aren't ready for project finance yet, and certainly not project finance at rates that we're going to deliver returns to investors that were going to be attractive. So part of what we're doing is adapting our strategy to meet the needs of the market and to help these developers move from what has predominantly been a grant-funded business model into more commercial capital. So they're starting to move towards their Series A or towards their intermediate investments. But in Africa, as many of you know, there's not the big community of angel investors and venture capital investors that are necessary to really accelerate the growth and deployment of new technologies. So we're coming in with venture debt and a variety of preferred equity options at the corporate level in order to help these companies both build more microgrids, uh, which is fundamentally what we're all looking to deliver, uh, and also to get to their Series A, to get to the types of returns that are going to be attractive to the venture capital community and to others. But that fundamentally will require public-private partnership. There is, especially in these early days, there's no way that we can go out and do what we do without strong support from government partners, both on the policy and regulatory side and on the actual investment side in terms of making grant capital and highly concessionary capital available to be deployed into this very early stage, very high risk sector. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. And that was actually a great segue. Sort of, there's been talk of um, different financing, uh, venture capitalism, et cetera, um, and that, and then sort of shifting towards talking about the role of government and public-private partnerships. Um, so that that ties in nicely with the first question that I wanted to ask, which was sort of that we are sort of seeing this. Um, sort of stark contrast between uh, grid and grid extensions and then sort of the microgrids uh, and sort of this classic um, debate about sort of the roles that each of them have to play and sort of how they can work together. So I wanted to sort of segue to talking about, well, how are you seeing that, um, that how are countries perceiving uh, these off-grid technologies more generally? Um, have they have we sort of overcome this uh, perception that uh, off-grid technologies or sort of uh, decentralized renewables are providing sort of some or not providing an alternative to grid-based power? Sort of are we sort of bridging that gap? And and how are countries thinking and sort of looking forward uh, to thinking about integrating the microgrids into the grid and 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 sort of that next step? Um, so I, I open it up to you, Andy, first, and then we can proceed uh, along with any of the other panelists that want to contribute. So I say I'm really optimistic about where things are headed because it's such an exciting and dynamic market, and it's so wide open. And um, you know, there's not going to be any one solution for any one country. So how are countries uh, accepting it? Uh, it's different. You know, if you're the Rural Energy Agency, government funded. You're not going to like the the solar home system companies because you view them as a threat, and then you know they're starting to apply VAT taxes to them, make it more difficult for them, or they'll say things like, "It's not real power." Well, it is real power. It's real electricity. Where I will agree with them is, you still can't boil a pot of water with a 200 watt panel, and so everyone needs to improve their business models and think differently because I actually think that. So one of two things will happen. Either you're going to have to have microgrids so that people can have more productive use, and I think those will grow from the bottom up from the solar home system companies. And a microgrid company can't be successful just by dropping into a community. You have to know your customer. I mean, if, you're, if someone presents you with a business plan, you're going to want to know who your customer is. You want to know about your customer. And how do you get that information? Well. The solar home system companies know who's paying what, how much they're paying, and what intervals, what their demand is. So you either need to buy one of those companies, or one of those companies needs to say, all right, I'm not offering enough power to boil a pot of water, or to charge an electric motorcycle, or do other things. Let's now, now that we know what our customer base is, now let's offer them something a little bit more. Um, there's so much room for growth here. It's just people being smart. It's not even a technology issue. It's, it's just being smart business people. Technology will make margins better as storage prices come down and costs of components come down. But it's about policy, making sure that the governments are open to, to people to, for, for companies to experiment a bit more, not trying to immediately tax everything. And um, making sure that they're, they're open to, to, to different types of business models. One of the ideas that I had recently was um, 
and I got a little bit of pushback from my own team, is if you look at the distribution companies or the utilities in countries, um, why not ring fence a social services company to take all of those rural customers, people aren't connected, off the book so you don't hurt the balance sheet for all of the other industrial and, and, and higher end customers? And then recognize, the government recognize that the government will have to subsidize it, but don't make it a rural energy agency because when it's a rural energy agency, it's government employees who are, who are impacted by political imperatives and political pressures, run it as a private company, but with a recognition that the government has to subsidize it because if you really want to get everybody some access, there are private sector ways to do it. But it doesn't have to be the $1,200 connection that, that, that they were doing in Kenya. It could be, tell the private sector, you know, this is the amount of subsidy we'll give you and you make it work. And you have to make adjustments, you make adjustments, but if you really want to get access, let the private sector do it. Yeah, I would, I would agree with everything that, that Andy said. Well, I think, first of all, uh, the choice between sort of main grid and mini grids or decentralized is a false choice. Um, those two solutions converge in what will be the grid of the future. And as, you know, an overused phrase in these sort of panels is leapfrog, but there is an opportunity for uh, Africa to leapfrog to a more advanced, more distributed grid um, and not go through the same legacy, dirtier infrastructure that we have uh, in the U.S. Um, so, and, and this has happened in other countries. You know, this is not the first time this has happened. If you look at Cambodia, you know, 7 percent of the population of Cambodia is served by or was originally served by privately operated mini grids, and then as the grid expanded, those were connected into the grid. So it's important to have that in mind because, you know, people need regulatory certainty to have the comfort to make these mini-grid investments, which are not going to uh, make a return for 10 years or longer. And so if you're worried about the regulator coming in and saying you can't serve these customers privately anymore or artificially lowering your tariff, you're not going to be willing to make that investment. And I think there are certain countries in Africa, in particular Nigeria, just passed, I think, probably the most advanced um, and forward-looking mini-grid uh, regulatory act. I think you know, Tanzania um, is, is relatively forward-leaning as well. Um, so I think that's, that's an important element to this conversation. And then, you know, taking a long-term view on what makes sense. Basically, if you're a customer within 600 meters of existing grid, grid extension probably makes sense. But then you can say of customers that are already four kilometers or more away from the grid, that's probably where it makes sense to look at many grid options. But again, those have to be designed with the idea that the grid will eventually arrive in most cases and so that they're fully compatible and can be integrated and that the regulations permit that as well. Can I ask a, just a sort yeah. of follow-up question on that? Because so my understanding is that it does require a fair amount of pre-planning with the mini grids to make sure that they will be compatible um, when the grid does arrive, mm -hmm. when and if the grid uh, arrives. So are you seeing sort of certain uh, sort of impediments mm -hmm. to making sure that those sort of upfront, that upfront planning happens? Um, is it sort of a cost issue or sort of? Yeah, I think it's a, there's, it's a, there is, I mean, there's a cost and design time issue and obviously um, the communication with uh, the, the regulatory bodies in the country, but I think those, those are quite surmountable. We do see a lot of room um, for cost to come down. So when we look across, and we've looked across a lot of different mini-grid developers uh, in Africa, there's wide variance in costs, surprisingly so, given that you think that the costs and components would be relatively standardized. Mm -hmm. So if you can move everyone to sort of where best-in-class uh, connection costs are, you would see costs coming down from, say, an average of $1,000 per mini-grid connection to $500 per mini-grid connection. And there's lessons learned from India and other places where are sort of farther down the track in terms of mini-grid uh, that can be used there. So I think it's a surmountable, surmountable issue. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the way we approach the problem is thinking about it from a weak grid perspective. So we believe that the reason why you have this or question of standalone solar home systems in the first place and your question of uh, the microgrid in the first place is because these grids are very weak. So either you have very high intermittency on the grid, so you take a country like Nigeria, there's about 30 to 40 percent intermittency on that grid, um, or you know you have no access at all. So you have this question of are you doing grid extension or are you doing grid intensification? And when it comes to that question, we want to bet that you know, African governments and their regulatory bodies are not going to be perpetually dysfunctional. There's going to be a time in which the grid is going to get to people, and the levelized cost of electricity of the grid is always going to be much more affordable than any other source of electricity on the grid. So it is very important to us to seek 
microgrid solutions that will seamlessly integrate when the grid does arrive. That is what we fundamentally believe as a fund. And because of that, we are not really trying to reinvent microgrid technologies. We are trying to figure out how to provide this seamless integration. I was in Nigeria in November and I met with a couple of the disco companies and a couple of the uh, guys at NERC, which is the Electoral, uh, Electricity Regulation Com uh, Commission, as well as the guys at the Rural Electrification Commission. And there is an aspirational tendency of these governments to actually extend the grid to their citizens. And so we want to support that. We don't want to be in a situation where we are placing bets on the perpetual dysfunctionality of governments. But we want to support the question that when these governments get their act together, whatever solutions we are providing will readily integrate um, into this grid. Thanks. I, I, it's an incredibly exciting time in Africa. I think there's we work with about 13 different countries um, in a community of practice around microgrid policy and regulatory enabling environments. And they are hungry to understand how we develop new systemic regulatory processes that enable the deployment of microgrids as an integrated energy access and electrification strategy. Um, so it is, it is very core to how governments are beginning to think. The government of Nigeria is about to take a $300 million grant from the World Bank. 150 of that is earmarked for off-grid and microgrids. Um, so the, these governments are really thinking in new and innovative ways about how to integrate microgrids and off the off-grid space as a core component of their electrification strategy. Microgrids are not new to these countries. Mm -hmm. Kenya operates what? 80 microgrids or something, a, a huge number of microgrids that are all run on diesel gen sets right now. So there's an opportunity, and if you look at the operational costs, the real operational costs of these, they far exceed what people are going to end up paying under a microgrid scenario. So there, there is money to be saved in this space, and there are commercial investment opportunities, but lining up the regulatory and permitting pieces in such a way that we can actually start to unlock that potential is a key part of the work that we need to do over the next two to five years. Great. Thank you. Um, and sort of building on some of the things that you have uh, mentioned already, Alexia, about sort of public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, you know, sort of thinking about you know, the concerns that uh, we've had a lot of smart people working on these issues, but we haven't maybe cracked the code and figured out how to bundle projects and financing to really bring microgrids up to scale. Um, you mentioned the public-private partnerships. Is there anything else sort of that we've learned from sort of generation one of microgrids mm. that we can um, apply to sort of the next generation and yeah and it's I actually when I was looking at the prompts I was like oh that's how we talk about it too there there is this gen one generation first generation of microgrids um, that were sort of a build it and they will come uh, approach where they went out and they kind of guesstimated at potential latent demand in a community and they built a system. Sometimes they built the systems too small and then they got really unhappy customers and so they realized pretty quickly that it was actually better to go out and overbuild from the outset. But then you struggle to make sure that your system is being fully utilized and that costs money, right? Every you know cent that you sink into a battery energy storage array adds significant incremental cost uh, to your capital expenditures for the project. And so that whole process, the Gen 2 microgrids that we're seeing now, is that developers are taking a much more systematic approach, both to understanding the demands of their communities, to Andy's point, you have to understand the communities that you're working in, uh, and also really looking at strategic opportunities to build productive use. So how do we come in from the outset with an integrated strategy to make sure that we're not just building it and hoping that they will come, we're actually building it and providing the additional financial resources that are necessary in order to buy that grain milling machine. Um, and the developers are often doing this off of their own balance sheets because there's no other financing available for appliances, for grain milling machines, for the other productive assets that are really gonna drive that demand. Um, so part of our strategy when we deploy capital into these markets is to have our capital be able to be used by developers, not just for asset development, but also for productive end use program design and finance. Great, thank you. And sort of building on that, um, so you mentioned sort of one design of making sure that that's incorporated in the financing model. Um, 
are we seeing that this uh, th this concern and sort of uh, goal of having uh, increasing productive uses, are we seeing that it's being included in policies more generally, um, either sort of local or uh, national level governments um, that can help support off-grid renewables? And sort of, if not, what should they be? Why don't you talk about what you're doing? I think it's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, uh, one of the things that we're doing actually on the, on the advisory side right now is we've been working with Rockefeller Foundation to basically trial providing credit for appliances as part of the bundled mm -hmm. mini grid solution. So in other words, um, a customer who's getting a mini grid connection can also get a freezer or a TV or a grain mill or welding tools or other things um, as part of their connection and then have uh, 12 months to essentially pay that system off bundled into um, the overall cost. Um, because traditionally, the challenge is you get a connection, but you don't actually have anything to plug in. Mm -hmm. And so the consumption numbers are very low. The mini grid operator is not getting um, enough revenue from that customer. Uh, and the customer themselves is not getting as much use out of electricity uh, as otherwise. And so um, that initial sort of trial is running across about 22,200 connections right now. Um, we're just in the early days in terms of collecting some of that data. Um, but you know, there's some interesting things that come out of that. For example, you know, a freezer consumes, say, three times as much electricity as a TV. You also use a freezer during the peak of the day, which is also when you have peak sun. So that's actually your lowest cost of energy. So a freezer is a great, um, from a business perspective, uh, thing to give on credit to these customers. Um, and the same thing with grain mills, sort of tools of the working day are used in the middle of the day. Um, so we think there's a lot of interesting innovation in this productive use space. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily policy driven at this time, it's just driven by the business case and the need um, to drive up consumption. Yeah. I, I think microgrids are going to be the future and I think they will be commercially viable. You just have to have smart business people who look at the whole, it's got to be the cross subsidization. So you think about it, all right, a uh, household solar system cannot boil a pot of water. So I'm going to have a microgrid and I'm going to give everybody an electric tea kettle because they're going to use that twice a day and they're going to cause them to consume a little bit more electricity. On the flip side is the televisions are going to consume less and less electricity so I'm going to make my money from the financing of the television. So, so you have to just approach it from a business standpoint and looking at what your customers' demands are. And not only just within the microgrid is how do you bundle it with other things as well. I looked at this microgrid in Uganda on one of the islands and, and it serves about 2,400 customers and the guy who was running the utility said he's really struggling to make money. The only reason he makes money is they cross subsidize it with the fees from the, um, from the ferry that runs back and forth to the mainland. But there was, I was just looking at him like there was so much potential. He said that his customers are just lighting a few light bulbs. I'm like why aren't you setting up like an appliance leasing system for them, like they did in the U.S., and Jim mentioned this. In the U.S., when we did rural electrification, they went all over the country and they did appliance circuses. Come get a washing machine, come get a stove, get all these things. And, you know, you had GE Capital and all these things. That's, it, it, this is, it's been done before. It's not really complicated. I'm not a business person, but I, for some reason, I feel like the business people are just missing this. <laughs> <laughs> I did buy Apple stock at $7 share. <laughs> yeah, that's the guy who bought Kodak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bunmi, do you want to say anything about sort of the role of disruptive technologies in all of this? Yeah, I mean, I, there is a huge role for disruptive technologies. I think when you think about a lot of the cost of microgrids today is around demand aggregation, customer acquisition, yeah. um, simple technologies like Uber Pool. Mm -hmm. Can, you, okay. um, can help uh, in, in things like that, right? We don't have to go build a whole new hardware infrastructure to help, uh, uh, you know, five kilowatt systems connect seamlessly, you know, just create an Uber pool website and when you have enough customers, go build a microgrid. Um, we think that there is a strong role for very intelligent microcontrollers and there are a number of people that are working on that, right? ABB is uh, leading the chat on that, Schneider Electric is working on that. Um, there, there's just a lot of new technologies that uh, are, are coming from that old question of uh, one of the areas that we are making very strong investments in is storage right mm -hmm. we really believe that that is going to be fundamental to the success of microgrids in the developing world um, and the question there is beyond four to six hour lithium ion storage how do we get to 12 hour 24 hour storage right it's not a trivial 
uh, chemistry problem, right? It's actually a very significant physical problem to go solve. So we look at things like flow batteries. Uh, we look at other technologies that can enable that. Um, we again, coming to the question of methane utilization, you look at a country like Nigeria that flares <laughs> an incredible amount of gas. Well, you know, the problem is how do you do this cost efficaciously? How do you get the gas to these microgrids in, in a country that has very, very limited transportation networks, right? So these, this again, are, are the roles that we are thinking of. How do we use technology to solve these problems? You know, you have to capture the gas. You have to convert the gas to hydrogen. You have to put the hydrogen into a solid oxide fuel cell or burn it in an hydrogen turbine to produce electrons. Um, so there's a whole range of new technical thought um, that can be brought to bear um, onto these systems. Ultimately, you know, obviously we want to uh, reduce the cost of microgrids, but we believe that our capital should be invested in doing breakthrough technologies. There are other private equity kind of capital out there that can be available to microgrid developers to go build their microgrids. What we want to use our capital for specifically is the sponsorship of breakthrough technology and breakthrough business innovations. Great. Alexi, did you want to say anything to... We already I mean, had this conversation <laughs> last night, so, <laughs> so I know where she's I going. I gave him a very hard time. <laughs> right, right. I saw you shaking your head, so I wasn't sure if you, if you had something. Yeah, that you... I, I think the challenge is that the, whole, the capital markets right now are standing there doing this, right? That's why we're trying to raise this fund, because we, my, the micro developers that we work with are not delivering a risk adjusted return that's going to be at all interesting to this guy. Oh. And we're working with, you know, the, <laughs> the governments are pumping grant capital into this space, which is tremendous, but it's not enough. Um, we have to figure out a way to bring the private sector to the table. And yeah, but you show them a commercially viable model and they will pour in. Yeah. And as soon as one jumps Correct. in, yeah. they'll all jump in. Just like yeah. what you saw with the solar home system companies, private equity like jumped. You know, they threw so much money into solar home system companies last year. Yep. So one did it. Oh, well, I got to get in on this too. You get as soon as you break through that one. Yeah, but, but put start money at it. Just to, I mean, I think there is a, there is a big difference between solar home systems and, and mini grids. Solar home systems is essentially a consumer finance play where you can make a return on that investment in two or three years. Mini grids are an infrastructure play where you're taking a ten year horizon. Yep. Private equity funds aren't comfortable with that. The level of subsidy required is, is also much higher. Um, you know, if you look historically across, you know, countries that have electrified the rural population, whether it's Brazil, China, you know, they're subsidizing 85 to 100 percent of the cost of that rural electrification. What we're saying is that in mini grids, it's possible to do that now with, say, 40 to 50 percent subsidy. But you still need substantial government yeah. support. And so in terms of how we're thinking about structuring the capital stack for these investments, I think for the time being, you have a concessional or subsidy piece that's likely funded by a foundation or a more philanthropic type actor. But the idea is that you can point, when you, when you have success, you can point to that piece to the government and say, look, this is the chunk that you need to take over if you want us to take this to scale. Because we can't take this to scale just on the backs of foundations. Yeah, and Absolutely. just to say something about that, I was actually doing the business you were doing as we were talking about last night, two years before you were doing it in Nigeria and in Ghana. And ultimately, we think that the marketplace is going to solve that problem. There's going to be, um, you know, eventually a coincidence of DFIs talking to governments, talking to P funds that are going to be emerging, emerging market focused. So not all P funds want to go take a 10 to 13 percent unlevered IR risk in Africa, but there will be one or two of them that want to do that. We are not going to do that. That is not our, our business. But I think there's going to be a coincidence of this eventually, and that is a marketplace problem that will be solved. Is it going to happen in 2017 or 2018 or 2019? Frankly, I do not know. But I think that eventually we will get there. And we don't think that it's a region for venture equity. You know, a venture capital uh, trying to go back, a microgrid developer in Africa may be more of an impact fund yeah. than a venture yeah. capital. And just, to, sorry, just to be clear, I, it, what we're trying to do with the microgrid investment accelerator is to help bridge this divide, right? Because with all due respect, we can't wait until 2020 for the capital to start flowing. Right. We need it to flow today, and we need it to flow at much larger volumes than it is. And so what we're trying to do, there's uh, four or 500 million of debt funds at the DFIs that are either in the process of being raised or have already been raised. Do you know how much of that's actually been deployed? Goose egg. <laughs> because they can't do any deals. The deals are too small. 
they're too risky, and they don't, they don't deliver risk-adjusted returns that are of interest to the DFIs. So what we're trying to do is figure out how do we intermediate, how do we leverage the grant capital and the concessionary capital, blend it with the few brave impact investors that are willing to put some equity at risk with us, and actually deploy that into the market in order to start to catalyze investment. And the DFIs, we hope, will come, but it's going to be a little while. Great. Thank you. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about sort of getting the, the deals done or s sort of started. Um, I'm wondering how much are people thinking about sort of the sustainability of the microgrids or other types of uh, technologies after, after they're installed, sort of this classic uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's one thing to build it, but another thing to sort of keep it running and, and maintain it. Is this sort of in the discussions that any of you are having and, and sort of where are those discussions going, if so? You know, I, I, think it's, I think it's important from, uh, if you're trying to get senior debt, you know, they are going to look at basically the warranties and the reliability of the equipment that you're using, which sometimes holds us back from using the most innovative um, pieces of equipment on some of these sites. Uh, you know, that, that said, uh, there, for most of what we're doing, there's actually very little technical risk. I mean, solar is a very proven technology. The controllers can get better, but you have proven controllers. And so we feel comfortable um, in most of these investments taking you know, a 10 to 20 year view on the reliability of the equipment. Um, but when you talk about innovative battery technologies, and for instance, we used an innovative technology on one of our sites. Um, it's still functioning well on one of their, our sites, but that company went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, so we you know, took a risk on, on, a, on a technology. Right. We still think we'll be able to, that uh, technology will see us through on that particular project. But obviously, it's concerning to investors if the original company that was manufacturing that technology is no longer in business. Right, right. Well, I, th this is a very big topic, right? Because it comes into the question of how do you introduce new technology into a 25-year PPA, for example. And this is some of the risks people are just um, frankly unwilling to take in these parts of the world. It's one of the reasons why um, this is very difficult. One of the things we've been spending time thinking about is the end-of-life use of you know, this technology. Nobody knows what to do with lithium-ion batteries when the end of life comes around. Uh, so we have to think about that from an environmentally sustainable perspective. You know, if you go deploy all of these lithium ion batteries, when end of life use comes, what do we do with the batteries? Um, and so there are some questions that we have to address from, OK, our mi mission and remit is environmental stewardship. Uh, when you deploy these technologies, when that horizon comes, how are we solving these other questions? Um, uh, so let me stop at that. Great. Anyone else, sir? Okay. Um, so I wanted to. How am I doing on time? Okay. <laughs> We're okay on time. So I'll say something. About it. <laughs> look. So look to the future. I mean, everyone's got to think bigger. I mean. Mm -hmm. When I think about the microgrid, right, I always think about what's a village, I ask people, what's a village going to look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years? The market's going to get flooded with inexpensive electric motorcycles. How are you going to charge those? Are you going to have special stations that are people swap out batteries? Or is it going to be a microgrid, be able to do that from your house? The demand for electricity is going to increase, mm -hmm. um, and it's going to exceed what the household solar you know, systems are able to provide, unless they grow significantly. But it's at the same time that you're getting greater efficiencies, which means there's less demand for electrons, for productive use, you're going to need more and more. And then also, as you're looking in smaller communities where people have more and more productive use, the economies are going to grow as well, which will create more demand as well, which will mean more industry will grow as well, which means it's going to be required to have more and more electricity. So I just imagine that the microgrid will become more just distributed generation. And it'll just be sort of the start. But again, just like with the solar home system company, we're starting off knowing your customer. And you can grow from that and start say, all right, they've outgrown their solar home system. Let's figure out who we should provide a microgrid to. That microgrid will then grow as the community grows. And there'll be more and more demand for power. And then you'll just have a distributed generation system. Great. I, so I, the thing that excites, one of the many things that excites me about microgrids um, is the, the microgrid developer as the utility of the future, right? Of being able to come in and not just provide electricity, but also provide clean water. And in fact, what we're seeing with a number of our partners is that they are building water purification, uh, mini water purification systems 
that uh, consume a lot of power, they need a lot of power to run them, that's actually the profit driver of their microgrids, <laughs> um, is selling the clean water. They're able to sell clean water for significantly less than folks are paying for it today, and that's becoming the profit driver for their business model. So as we're waiting for the CapEx cost to come down and for the incredibly important work that people uh, like the Breakthrough Energy Venture Coalition are doing on technology innovation to start to bear fruit and help us drive down those costs, we really need to start thinking about integrated strategies to drive profitability and get those services into these communities. Because you just, the, the potential that entrepreneurship offers is absolutely incredible. Um, so we've seen some amazing examples where you give somebody a freezer or an ice cream making machine and the ability to chill Coke and their profit margin, their sales increase sevenfold within a matter of two months because it turns out people like cold sodas. Uh, so it can even be as simple as just having a, a refrigeration system that will be the profit driver for your entire business. One of the things that we've been thinking about is how to also facilitate conversation with discos. Because if you think in the future as microgrid being utilities uh, in a box of sorts, there's going to be a future where they would need to integrate with the distribution companies on the ground. And, you know, when I was meeting in Nigeria with one of the leading distribution companies, one of their biggest problems is collection losses, right? They just cannot collect, you know, money from customers. So you have the question of ability to pay and willingness to pay. Um, and so microgrids are going to face the same questions, right, around this. So uh, we've met utility companies, I mean, distribution companies with as high as 60% collection loss. You know, there's actually a program um, in certain parts of uh, Nigeria sponsored by the U.S. government in which you have Ukrainian mercenaries going into villages to collect money um, from people for, uh, for, for electricity. So when you have that kind of environment, you have to really study this question of collection losses. If it's happening for the discos, it will happen for the microgrid companies. And I think that there's a much more significant conversation that microgrid developers have to have with the distribution companies on the ground. Great, thank you. So I, uh, I will ask one more question before we open it up to the audience for questions, but this can be a relatively quick one. And just, but I, from my perspective, it's a very important question. So, you know, we have at Duke uh, quite a number of researchers that are interested in working on these topics. Um, we want to be working on topics that are relevant and of use to practitioners. So do any of you have thoughts on sort of what are some of the key unanswered questions where academics could play an important role and in, in sort of helping move forward um, this sort of acceleration of energy access? Yeah, I mean, I think, and you guys are already doing this, and we're plugging in um, some of our data uh, into your research already. I think, you know, as mentioned, one, the key, there's two key issues for, for mini grids in terms of a return perspective. Number one is how you drive the capex down to an acceptable level per connection. There's research to be done there, and benchmarking and best practices to be done there. The other question is how do you accurately um, predict and increase consumption, increase demand? Um, and what are the right um, villages to do that in? What are the right types of customers? What's the profile of those customers? What are the best appliances to do that with? And all of those are essentially analytics type questions. Um, and so, you know, one of the people that we have now in our mini grid team based on Nairobi, you know, came from BCG from a big data, was on their big data team at BCG. And, you know, these are the areas where we see this great opportunity to share data with foundations, share data with academic institutions, uh, and leverage that intellectual horsepower. I think in the area of really the cost of connection, so there are going to be areas, like you said earlier, where it makes sense to go deploy solar home system. There's going to be areas to do grid extension, and there's going to be areas for grid intensification. And what is the cost dollar per kilometer of bringing that customer online? I think there's a level of granularity that we need to do. I, I, the World Bank is already using geospatial technologies to actually figure this out, um, such that you know if it makes sense to get a guy that is, you know, three kilometers away from the grid, a line, um, you know, versus let's go deploy solar home system that is not going to use. Um, that level of geospatial granularity is going to be very helpful. And I think this is really the domain of academic institutions and government agencies like the World Bank. Great. Yeah, and just quickly, just to echo, I totally agree with um, what Jake was saying about helping understand sort of cost impacts of particular deployment for productive end use. I think the other big area that I see opportunity is in impact measurement. 
So it's the kind of thing that we as impact investors are required to do by our investors. It's really expensive. It's very time consuming. It takes a lot of people power that frankly we don't have. We just don't have the margins to integrate that effectively into our business. And so part of the academic community could be enormously helpful in really helping us do a better job of understanding the impact that microgrids and productive end use and energy access is having, uh, not just on the quality of people's lives, but also on the direct kind of economic development benefits, because that helps us you know, with, with donors and other folks who we need to be at the table and participating in a real way. Um, and just general data collection, transparency, and quality. So all of those things are dramatically missing in this sector, which makes it very difficult for investors to truly assess where the, the investable opportunities are and where the best places to direct resources is. Great. Thank you. I got one for you. <laughs> take, my, <laughs> take my broad assertion sort of about if you spent 10% of the amount of time and resources on energy access, you'd solve the, the climate change issues. And actually look at that. Look at how much time and resource do we spend on that debate and trying to address these issues. And then look at energy access and sort of look at um, the impact that the solar home system companies have had on driving innovation for energy efficiency and how um, what the spillover effect could be eventually when when people who are living on grid are using these appliances, these super efficient appliances as well, and make the case, I mean, or do the research on it, say, is there something there? I mean, if, if we were to spend a significant amount of money on energy access, which means spending a lot of money on battery technology for storage, a lot of money on other technological developments to drive down costs, and things got adopted, you know, in rural areas, but then they developed into microgrids, does that have a significant impact on, on, on carbon emissions? And I guarantee you that it will. But really dig in. I don't know what the exact angle would be, but, but start looking at that. And, and that will drive in a lot more resources than anything else that you can show. If you can say, you know, we're focusing on the wrong thing. We're all complaining and we're arguing about whether there's climate change or not. Or many people are complaining and arguing about that. But if we could just give people electricity access in a, in a sustainable way and in a market-based way, it's just going gonna, gonna to happen. I mean, emissions are going to come down. Great. Thank you all for that. So I think uh, we have a few minutes to open up uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, we have a microphone here, so if people could raise their hand high. If maybe one there. Hi, <clears throat> Justin Gway from Climateworks. I just wanted to say thanks for a great conversation. You guys are, could listen to this all day. Um, just one comment, not really a question, um, but I wanted to follow on to Alexia's point about um, the problem that we actually have a lot of money coming down the pipe and we probably won't be able to spend it well. And I think if you think about the evolution of the demands from the space, particularly the entrepreneurs, it's been driven by the evolution of the sector as a whole. So it's primarily been a question of quantum of money and primarily focused on working capital because the first generation of companies were lantern providers and home system providers. And if the future is mini grids, um, and mini grids are much earlier on, uh, the type of capital that's needed is totally different. Um, and we will squander this money and this opportunity if we can't spend that money well because we don't have the right flavor of money. So I guess the point is that we should stop paying so much attention to how much money can we raise and be excited by the headline numbers and start looking at the quality and flavor of money we can raise because if we don't have early stage project development money, if we don't have concessionary money, we're going to have $500 million funds sitting out there that don't get spent. Um, and that will be a tremendously squandered opportunity. Thank you. Anyone else next? I saw one over there. If it's just trying to... Let me just make a quick comment on that while you bring the mic over. So I think there's, there's two related challenges there. One is there's already been too much capital raised, in my opinion, basically for energy in Africa at like the big fund level. What you're missing is intermediaries on the ground that can develop and deploy that money into to projects. And what we found on the commercial industrial side it was, is it wasn't enough just to provide the finance. Um, even being on the ground, it wasn't enough just to provide the finance. We really had to in-house a lot of that development and engineering capability to develop those projects, because the projects aren't there sort of sitting, waiting, ready to be financed. There's a lot of development work that has to go into it. And the other thing is, to your point on flavor of money, you know, one of the challenges that has now happened in the solar home system space is a lot of that money was raised 
uh, from venture capital targeting you know, 30, 40% IRR or better returns. Um, that implies certain expectations about the speed of growth, the future size of the market, which can put those companies in an unsustainable cycle. When you think generally about the business, you know, this is essentially a utility type business, which means it should be utility type cost of capital. So say overall 10% cost of capital. And I think there's been a mismatch between how the money was raised and the vision that was sold when that money was raised and what the reality is on the ground. Hello, uh, I'm Harsh. I'm an undergrad currently studying at Duke. Uh, thank you so much for that talk. It was really interesting to listen to all the different perspectives. Uh, it seems like energy access is like an issue that requires a lot of different fields. It requires like engineering, technology, finance, business, but also like people behavior. Uh, so my question is for me and like other students in the audience, what would your advice be? Like kind of what are skills we should pick up? What can we do while in college? And what is there to look forward to when it comes to energy access and kind of getting into this issue? Business skills. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't really know much about this field, but it's not difficult. You, have, you can surround yourself by engineers and, and other people who can design things, but you know how to run a business. Because there's so much opportunity here. I, I, I do think it's a, well, yes, yeah, I completely agree. And, and, and Lauren Cochran's in the background here um, from Blue Haven Initiative, which was one of our early investors. And she, uh, just to highlight, she just wrote a great blog post on Medium about, what, you know, how do you, because people ask all the time, how do you get into impact investing? And the reality is you have to have a hardcore business skill set. You have to do the years that you might not want to do at a blue chip sort of firm like a McKinsey or an investment bank or a private equity fund to have that basic sort of uh, toolkit, um, and it's unrealistic to think that you know just because you read an article in the Financial Times and got interested in this, but you come from a purely public policy background, that you can then go launch a business or become an impact investor. That said, you know I I personally did a joint degree program, MBA and Masters in Public Policy. We see a lot of people in this space coming from that sort of multidiscipline background, and that's one of the fun parts is that you're bringing hopefully some of that business acumen that you've picked up working at a private equity fund, but also that ability to communicate across stakeholders, to communicate to governments and philanthropic um, donors and, and folks like USAID, okay, how is this achieving the development outcomes that you care about? Because you don't care about my IRR, but you do care about the development outcomes. Great, thank you. Uh, Tim, you were pointing, I think, this, I think this will be our last question, actually. Uh, so, um, yeah. Hi, Seema Patel. I'm with, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, which is an in initiative under the United Nations Foundation. So you can probably guess where my question might be going. Um, so if we talk about the sort of microcosm of the clean cooking sector, um, you know, the, a lot of the things that you were talking about uh, in in the aspect of talking about microgrids um, and mini grids is very, very much resonates with, with me and with our, with our organization, with our sector. We're talking about willingness to pay, uh, demand generation, uh, sort of de-risking the story when we're talking about investors and, and how we can really bring a commercialized perspective to those investors when we're talking about a very nascent sector like clean cooking. But if, in, in terms of sort of bridging, bridging the gap between our microcosm and what you're here talking about, um, you know, sort of larger scale electrification, uh, decentralized approach sort of leading to, to broader energy access and productive use. How, if, if you can speak to a little bit about maybe what your different organizations have done in terms of um, making that connection to the clean cooking space. So you talk a lot about appliances as being really the driving factor for uh, revenue opportunities for the private sector. Um, what have what have you each individually done as an organization, and where do you see that going in terms of connecting to the clean cooking space? It's a great question, and one that I actually spend a lot of time thinking about in the context of both gender, you know, a gender lens in terms of our investment strategy, but also just in solving the problem. And cooking is really hard, right? Like it's you, it's getting sort of thermal-based cooking options, you know, plugged into a power system doesn't work. Uh, and so what we've been thinking about is this idea of the microgrid uh, developer as a utility and a distribution network, because that essentially is what it will become, um, but partnering to look at opportunities like LPG containerized alternatives um, that unfortunately are still largely fossil fuel based, um, but biomass cooking, clean cook stoves, and just how we think about as we're financing various pieces of the chain, how we integrate a more explicit focus on clean cooking. 
And when you talk to people about that, like it's hard enough to talk to people about microgrids and just electricity provision. Their eyes start glazing over when you're trying to add on these other things. And so our strategy has sort of been, let's, let's help these guys get established as electrical distribution and figure out a business model that works there and then start thinking about the cooking issues and how we layer that on. I recognize that that's not a very good answer. Uh, we, do, we similarly have zero time to waste in this sector um, and would love to think through how we can both realistically and cost effectively integrate clean cooking solutions into the products and the work that the developers that we work with are doing in a way that's not gonna overburden what is an already incredibly complicated business model. I've got a good answer. Because <laughs> I'm passionate about this. And it goes, again, towards looking towards the future and sort of projecting out like, in your ideal world. So for me, what does success look like? I, I love the solar home system companies. But I, any time I hear them say, we don't need the grid, I'm like, sorry, but you can't cook. And I don't see a future where someone is using biomass with a solar panel. So just stop telling me about that. So for me, it goes hand in hand. I see there's no reason that in five to 10 years, everybody in the world can't have a solar home system for electricity and LPG for cooking. I mean, it's distribution networks. You got to figure all of that out. But that's what we should be looking toward. But is LPG the long-term solution? It's going to run out at some point, a couple hundred years from now. But once you get people who have their electricity and they've got their cooking with LPG, then they you know, their, their life is improving, they have more disposable income, that's when you start moving into the microgrid and then you can start transitioning them from LPG to electric cooking. But, and that's when you need the bigger system. So it's, it's not really complicated. It's, uh, you know, we can keep trying to make solar induction ovens that no one likes the way the food tastes or try to reduce the amount of biomass a person uses. That's great for now. Just give a person some, you know, figure out how to bundle the services together. Just like for a while we all got, you know, telephone, cable TV, and everything else all as a service. It comes down to business model. Partner with an LPG company, figure out how to distribute, you know, do distribution networks, use the same pay-go system that you do, and get people cooking solutions. And then eventually, as they're, you know, you can transition to electricity. So one I of the biggest challenges in the developing world is networks. The, the dysfunctionality is around learning how to build an electric distribution network, learning how to build an L L LPG network. The question is, there's a, a gap in the competencies of building networks. Mm -hmm. um, one of the areas that we are really thinking about is how do you do that in a decentralized form? How do you bring, I mean, I sat with the city, CEO of Stat Oil in Norway a couple of months ago, and he frankly said there's no incentive for us to do L LNG in Nigeria. We're not getting paid for it. Imagine we're getting on cooking gas is meaningless. We can't go build a whole infrastructure to deliver a resource that we can't make a profit on. So those guys are not going to capture the gas. They're going to flare it. They're not going to build a distribution network. They have no incentive to do so. Um, so this is the role of technology. We look at that picture and say, how can we create a technology that can you know, arrest that problem of going to build a multi-billion dollar pipeline? How do we solve that in a distributed format? Um, you know, so I think gas is going to be, play a very, very strong role. You need technology to solve that. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. I think we are over our time. <laughs> um, but this has been incredibly interesting for me and I think I'm sure for the rest of the audience. So thank you very much to all of our panelists. Uh, if we could thank them.